Welcome to the podcast of Leeds First Methodist Church. We are so glad you decided to tune in with us today. The following sermon was preached by Pastor Chris, and it is the last sermon in our church's trade-offs series. If you would like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so by visiting our website at leedsfirst.org, and at the top of the page, go to Worship and click Online Worship. God, we praise your powerful, your holy, and your loving name. Name, Jesus. We give you all honor and glory. We receive from you your, your power and your purpose. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now you may be seated if you would like. Well, my name is... Chris Stallings, and it's a privilege to get to pastor this church. I had a, uh, a kind of whoo moment this morning. I want to give a shout out to the parents who are engaging their faith and engaging the faith of their kids at our um, worship walkthrough looked out with three parents, with each of them having their kids serving with them while they were setting up communion or singing or working in the sound booth. And um, hey, y'all are doing good. And if you're uh, struggling, hang in there. You're doing good. And um, if we can be helpful to you, keep on, keep on. It's good stuff. Well, we're in the finale of our series, Trade-Offs. We know life is filled with these trade-offs. Do we get enough sleep or do we get to work on time, <laughs> right? Do we get a new car or do we continue to save for retirement? When we give up something, we hope to get something else back or in return the trade-offs. In this series, we looked at God's guidance and making some of those real-world trade-offs. If you missed any of these sermons, and go to our website, leadsfirst.org, and click on the worship uh, link or tab, and uh, you can find a link to our YouTube channel. It's got all these on there. Catch up. Um, I've been encouraged. I've been encouraged by reading through these. Our key verse, Mark eight thirty six for this series, and it reads, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own? soul. Today in our finale, trade-offs, busy and caring. Busy and caring. Quick survey, and you have to participate if you have a driver's license. Mm. All right. How many of you are very patient when you drive? Raise your hand. I got four, five, six liars in the building. <laughs> All right, the truth tell is who's very impatient when you drive, right? No, I don't know that you're lying. I experienced both of those this week, patience in driving and impatience, even for myself, right? Patience while I was driving and impatience. On Friday this week, Friday is my off day or rest day or Sabbath and uh, try to lock that in as much as possible. And my wife and I uh, took that to take a leisurely drive to South Carolina in advance of our daughter's soccer game over there that was going to be on Saturday. And by leisurely, I meant pretty leisurely, right? We crammed a four-hour drive into six hours, right? I set the cruise at two miles under the speed limit, just kind of getting there, right? Didn't stress if somebody is going slow in front of me. Even took the long way to kind of avoid some of the headaches of going right through or the worst part of Atlanta. Even went in to the fast food place for lunch instead of just through the drive through It was very nice. However, on Saturday, the host school changed the order of the games. The girls usually play first and then the, the guys team. And they changed it where the guys play first and the girls were last. And it set us back three hours when we could leave South Carolina. The best laid plans, right? 
And so we were hightailing it out of there <laughs> to get back over here because you're supposed to sleep on Saturday night before Sunday at church. And so I didn't really set this cruise at, well, let's just say it was at a different speed. My casual heart for other drivers turned to angst when they didn't do just like I wanted them to do. I even had to go through the part of Atlanta that is the, the worst. Even went through the drive through instead of going in when we had to get dinner on the way home. And of course, then you get it on your... I confess, I have less nice words to share on my urgent driving. And I may need to replace the fuse on my car's horn for overuse, right? It's probably true we all experience different levels of patience when we drive. It's hard to be caring when you're in a hurry. And it feels like sometimes, maybe you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but sometimes it feels like busyness is a badge of honor. Right? You, you know somebody, you go up to them, how you doing? And it's inevitable, sooner or later, maybe often, you'll get the response, busy. We're just so busy. And busyness probably comes from a life that is rooted in a, a good work ethic. But if you're busy on the picture of the, the worship guide or on the screen, you got all the post-it notes, right? Anybody use post-it notes to write down what you got to do, right? You got a post-it note like I'm supposed to call this person. I got a, a post-it note with a, a, a number I'm supposed to remember. I got a post-it note with some word on it. I have no idea what it is, you know? Busyness comes from a sense or a good work ethic, probably, right? When we were in school, the teachers kept us busy. If they caught us daydreaming and not doing our lessons, we got scolded. The boss at your job may have gotten on to you if they caught you standing around on the job. Even the Bible says in one of the translations, the Living Bible, in Proverbs 16, 20 says, 16, 27 says, idle hands are the devil's workshop. And so laziness or idleness is not good, but when is busy too busy? And what impact does that have on the rest of your life? When are you too busy to care? We're going to look at the Bible, the gospel book of Mark. Mark chapter 10, if you've got your Bible, if you want to start finding that or opening it up. Mark 10 includes a number of scenes from the ministry life of Jesus where he had interactions with important people. He had teaching with the authority of God on subjects like marriage and kids and wealth and power. And if we look ahead past Mark 10, we see that Jesus was soon welcomed into Jerusalem as a king. And just a few short days later, he would go on to fulfill God's ultimate plan of salvation. And so there's no doubt Jesus <clears throat> was important. And if someone came up to him and asked, so how's it going, Jesus? No doubt he could have honestly answered, busy. It's just so busy. But let's look at how Jesus encountered people whenever that was the case. If you with me, I'm looking at Mark 10. We're going to read verses 46 through 52. I'm going to read the New Living Translation, or NLT, if you want to follow along word for word. The word should also be on the screen. <clears throat> Mark 10, 46. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, or son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. 
but he shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell, me, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Well, in verse 49, we see the, the pivot or the change from busy to caring. Jesus was among a large crowd of people, and in that, from within that, he heard the cry of one man, the blind man who needed help as a result of his blindness. He needed help just to maintain sustenance because he couldn't do what everyone else or work like everyone else could. And ultimately, he needed a desired healing. According to the word studies in the New Testament, blindness or diseases of the eye were not uncommon. A lot of dust and dirt and wind could project that and injure eyes. And some folks were born with diseases of the eyes or developed those. It's estimated maybe as many as 20% had some limitation or even blindness. So there were all kinds of people in that setting who had need, even others who may have been blinded by birth, by disease, or even injury. But in the middle of that large crowd, with all that was going on, and all those needs, Jesus stopped. And the encounter was meant not only to bring a physical touch and healing to the man, but to transform and build up his soul. You probably know someone you would like to cry out for or needs healing. In your life, you may desire healing. And God says, you're worth it. God loves you. That kind of help, when it seems all is lost, is a response in the very nature of God. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were all still sinners. Let's look now at how we might apply this passage to our life. Know its truths. Make the trade-off or balance busy and caring. We got your worship guide, either paper or online. I invite you to take it out now. We're going to go through these. If it's helpful to you, fill in the blank. You might know it and apply these truths to your life. Number one, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Verse 51 reads, What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to. Jesus sensed the need, and he listened. If you look around or listen in the world today, you will probably bear witness to hundreds or thousands or millions of needs. And the temptation is to... to plug our ears... Or to cover our eyes. That we don't become overwhelmed by all that there is. So much hurt 
does not mean to stop caring. We know Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, what? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's from Mark 12, 31. And loving your neighbor requires caring. You may have heard this phrase, analysis paralysis. Anybody ever heard that before? It talks about where you can't do anything or the inability to make a decision or take action due to the overwhelmingness of information or the problem or circumstance. This can happen in bad things. It can happen in good things. Anybody got a Netflix account? Can I borrow your password? No, don't do that. Just kidding, I've got my own. But if you look at what all is on Netflix, I have no idea how many. Anybody know how many different titles or entries there are on Netflix? I guess there's tens of thousands, right? At least. There may be more than that. And you think, there's got to be something perfect for me. And so we set out searching for it, right? Oh, do I want a movie or a series? A documentary, a docu mockumentary, you know, and we go through this stuff, and we're like, well, what are we going to, oh, let's watch the previews of these, and go through the previews, and we start deciding, and here we are two hours later, and we still hadn't decided yet, and all the popcorn is cold, or it's already gone. Life can be like that, and the good things, and in the things that are hurts or problems that we see for others. There's a pastor named Andy Stanley. Some of you have heard of him. Some of you probably love him. Some of you are like, I don't know if I like him. And um, he has got a Baptist background. So uh, anyway, but there's some good in what he has taught. And they used to do this thing. They may still do it. It's called Catalyst. It was a conference for church leaders and, and church uh, folks to go and get equipped and learn about ministry. And I was at one about, probably about 15 years ago, maybe. And he says that pastors or people in ministry can feel trapped by the expectations of people. He said if he did something for someone, others would say, well, why won't you do that for me? And so the temptation as a pastor or as a, a ministry leader or even a church member is that, well, i got to be fair, right? And then you say, well, I can't do that for everyone, and so you do nothing for anyone. And his conclusion from studying the life of Jesus for himself, for pastors, for other people is the, of the church, is do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And for all do that, that we get a lot more of the caring done than if we say, well, I can't do it all, so I'm not going to do any of it. Jesus didn't heal everyone that day. In his ministry, did, Jesus didn't heal everyone in the area around him, and he didn't heal them of every disease and for eternity. But on that day, he stopped. He listened. So do for one what you wish for everyone. Number two, the trade-off. Don't get too busy to care. Don't get too busy to care. Verse 48 reads, Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on on me. The crowd said, be quiet. Don't bother Jesus. Jesus is too busy. And what we know, busy crushes compassion. If you think about it, when are you least compassionate? When you're busy, right? When are you least patient in your driving? When you're in a hurry, right? And so busyness or rushing Hurriedness crushes compassion. But margin conceives care. But 
margin conceives care. You need time in your daily, in your weekly, in your life to reintroduce compassion for others. So here's some quick take it down notes. This comes from an article on worklifepsych.com. Don't say yes to everything. If you say yes to everything everybody else wants you to do, you're going to be full. And whenever God introduces a chance for you to share compassion, you're like, I'm too busy. Right? So how do you know what to say yes for? Second thing is to prioritize what's important in your life. If you've got priorities, you're going to pick the things that fulfill those and the things that don't mean anything to you, to your family, to your faith, you're going to say, I'm going to get rid of those. One, so I can focus on those priorities, but two, so I can have some space in my life, some time margin where I can show compassion to others. The third step is to focus on those things that are important and stop multitasking so much. What do they say? Busy, you got so many irons in the fire, right? And so when we try to keep all the plates in the air, that's another metaphor, we can't do anything well. Fourth thing, don't procrastinate and let things build up. When you let things go, they begin to overwhelm you. It just adds to the busyness of your life. Oh, I got all these things to do. When you, it's time, do the thing for which it's time. And the fifth thing I'm adding, this is from the Bible, rest. Rest. Did you know you were created by God for rest? Now, don't hear this. You weren't created by God for laziness, right? That's not the same. If you look at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 2 2, it says, On the seventh day, what? God rested. He modeled for us how He created us in Exodus 28. In the commandments, it says, Remember the Sabbath. That's what weekly rest you're designed for, a day of rest, and it was called Sabbath. And in Mark, Two, Jesus declares the Sabbath was created for people and not people for the Sabbath. And so God designs you where you need rest, proper rest, not laziness, but good daily sleep, a weekly Sabbath to give your human nature the capacity to respond to God's Holy Spirit in your spirit nature to where you can live out the good that God hopes for you to live. Caring flows from that, and whenever you don't have rest or you're too busy, caring is the victim, and it struggles to exist without it. It's a trade-off. Don't get too busy to care. Number three, God's kindness, or caring, God's kindness frees us to truly follow Jesus. God's kindness frees us to truly follow Jesus. Verse 52. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. The trade-off that we just covered is a reminder of how important caring Christians are to the mission of God. The Bible says in Romans 2, verses 4 and 5, And don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. If we look at this verse from Mark 10, verse 52, Bartimaeus 
regained his sight because of his faith and his interaction with Jesus. And then he began to follow Jesus. He believed in Jesus. His faith was to the extent that he had complete trust in him. He received the kindness of Jesus, and then he began to follow Jesus. That's the purpose of caring. That's why Jesus said the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God. Second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody had a busy week? If, you, if you're in school, it was homecoming, right? Cram 48 things in addition to our normal 48 things, right? I don't know everybody's circumstance, the travel, the work, but it's busy. It was a busy week for us in the church. Getting ready for charge conference tomorrow. Doing reports and proposals and start to work on budgets and adjustments. It's busy. It's easy to say, well, we've got to do that. I was tempted to say that. I can't do these other things. But God's like, mm, remember, you've got to preach this on Sunday. <laughs> so I tell you, become a preacher, and God preaches it to you all week, and then you get to share it with other people. There's two examples this week where God's like, mm, stop and care. One of them, I, I won't share the others, somebody in our congregation, but there's another one that uh, something we do in our, our office team. So we give away a, a food box that stuffed with different food items, and we get it from the Community Food Bank of Central Alabama. So Wednesday morning, got up, went with Joseph, and we picked up the thousand pounds of food we got this month. I brought it in here, and Andy Argo and I boxed it up. I think we made 41 boxes or something like that. And we'd been out for a couple of weeks, and so folks were calling and saying, hey, can I get a, can I get a, and we're like, oh, we're going to have it. It'll be there Thursday. So Thursday come, I think there's five people ready to get it. And one of them we hadn't seen in a while, and he's like, yeah, whatever. I was like, well, you know, you're welcome. Basically one a month. And he said, I brought my friend with me. And his friend had never come before. I said, what made you come? He said, I knew this is a place where we could get help. And so we started talking a little bit, just cutting up a little bit, sharing God's love and conversation and dignity. He made some joke, but also some serious stuff and learned about his friend that got an injury, got in shot in his young adult life and it affected his whole life come in and get a, a food box that day and it was his birthday and so we got to celebrate his birthday with a food box a little bit of fun and fellowship and I did sneak a Reese cup for him for his birthday I don't know what impact it has every time we share kindness but I know it's kind of like a foundation of God's love that's built up and showing into folks. You've probably experienced some of that through your parents that loved you, through the church that's loved you. It's my prayer she so don't get too busy to care. There's probably, I'd say, there's guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be more work in your life, in our lives, than we'll ever be able to get all done. But do you know what? God has designed the day, the sun to come up and go down, and whatever, however all that works, for 24 hours. And God has designed you for a purpose. God's designed you, God's designed time, and so if we believe God's design, there's enough. And if we we'll prioritize God's will in our life and own or let it own us his command to love your neighbor as yourself, God will and will never be too busy to care. God's
kindness frees us to truly follow Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the ministry, for the example, for the love on display in Jesus. God, I pray that you would give us a heart that's transformed by that love. God, where our bodies need that kindness, I pray you bring that. And God, as we are transformed, let us follow you. Let your kindness through us. Thanks for listening to our podcast. We would love for you to visit us in person at 8.45 a.m. for modern worship or at 11 a.m. for traditional worship. If you would like to plan a visit, simply text the word CONNECT to the number 205-772-4906 and you'll be sent a link to get you started. Thanks again and God bless.